Good morning, good afternoon, um, and good evening, uh, depending on wherever you are connecting uh, from. Uh, welcome to our session number 17 of our uh, special COVID-19 series, a series that we have dedicated to uh, diagnostics in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Today, we have uh, an interesting session, which is based uh, uh, on our DA manufacturers. We have uh, colleagues from uh, Euroimmune AG, uh, based in Germany, uh, as well as uh, Hologic, uh, here to share with us uh, what they do have in terms of diagnostics for which we know we still have quite a lot uh, to get updated on as this environment is a fluid one. Um, just a quick reminder um, on logistics. Uh, this will be uh, a one hour long session uh, made up of two presentations uh, from the colleagues that I've mentioned. Uh, each will give about 15 to 20 minutes of presentation followed by a question and answer segment. As the session goes on, put your questions and comments into the chat box as usual, and we shall uh, uh, address them immediately after the presentation. My name is Anafi Mataka from ASLM, uh, where I uh, save in our United uh, funded uh, projects around accelerating diagnostics, uh, as well as our Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded work on the laboratory systems community of practice. Uh, we shall start uh, with uh, Dr. Constance Stieber, uh, who is from Euroimmune. Uh, she is the project manager for inf uh, infection diagnostics. Constance uh, did her PhD uh, at the University of Greifswald, Germany, in the field of molecular biology, uh, biochemistry, and biotechnology finishing in December 2008. And she has spent several years in research at the University of Lund, Sweden, and Potsdam, Germany, before she switched to industry, working in marketing and business development. Since November 2014, uh, Dr. Constance has worked uh, at Euroimmune AG as a project uh, product manager. Let me hand over to Constance uh, to take us through the first presentation. Uh, over to you, Constance. As Constance is starting, I just want to remind our colleagues that we now have uh, interpretation from English to French. So feel free to choose your preferred language uh, from the screen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this very nice introduction. First of all, also from my side, a very warm welcome to this webinar. It's a very nice opportunity and I'm very grateful to be part of these uh, webinar sessions. And today I would like to give you a more detailed overview about the products that Euroimmune is offering in regards to SARS-CoV-2 diagnostics. And here I will mainly talk about the serological assays. So first of all, as you have heard probably in previous presentations during this webinar uh, program by ASLM, um, we have different opportunities, a different approach is when we talk about laboratory diagnostics. So on one side, we have the For acute diagnostics, of course, um, direct detection methods are the method of choice and mostly uh, the method that is used here are PCR methods. Euroimmune is also offering an RT-PCR, which I just want to introduce just shortly. This is based on the detection of two different target, anti uh, target genes from SARS-CoV-2. It's of course also fully validated and it's a very sensitive and specific assay. So especially in the first day, so around, let's say, two weeks after onset of symptoms, direct detection methods like our RT-PCR are the method of choice. But then, of course, the serology also plays a bigger role afterwards. So serology is not, as I mentioned, meant 
mentioned for acute diagnostics, it's mainly mentioned for tracing infection chains, for example, yeah, in order to identify previously unrecognized cases. Also, of course, for epidemiological data, which are the main issues at the moment. And of course, in regards to vaccine uh, development, it might also be very helpful to identify the right vaccine candidate. So the most vaccine vendors are based on or concentrate on a special antigen. And then the next slides, I will tell you a little bit more about the different antigens and the antigens we choose for immunoassays. Another approach, of course, could be as there is no cure, no therapy for COVID-19, would be the identification of potential convalescent plasma donors. We know from other examples, for Ebola, for example, it was also used a plasma of people who have already overcome the infection. Because this plasma includes, of course, antibodies which might be able to fight against the virus. So it could be of help for other patients uh, which might have a severe infection. So, but this is, of course, also related to the fact of immunity and immunity in regards to serology, to immunoassays like ELISA is, of course, um, at the moment not fully understand, but I will also talk about this a little bit later. It is not recommended, as I mentioned, for acute diagnostics and also here, especially the fact of immunity, so determine whether a patient had developed protective immunity is still an open question. So when we talk about antigens, especially when we talk about uh, different immunoassays and the antigens it should be based off, we have several opportunities. So in the picture on the right side on the upper uh, field of this slide, you can see the general overall structure of SARS-CoV-2. And it mainly consists of the spike protein, that's the surface protein, the nucleocapsid protein, the membrane protein, and the envelope protein. The highest immunogenic targets are the nucleocapsid protein and the spike protein. And when we developed um, assays for the detection of antibodies, we mainly concentrated on these two antigens. So on one side, we have an assay which is based on the S1 domain. The S1 domain is part of the spike protein, yeah, so part of the surface protein. And these S1 domain has one special feature. It includes the receptor binding domain. So it includes this domain that gets in contact with the human cell when the virus wants to infect the cells. And this is actually also the entry to the cell. So of course it makes sense that antibodies directed against these receptor binding domain might have neutralizing effects, which means neutralizing antibodies are fighting against the virus directly. So here there could be also the link to immunity. Yeah? So this is something one has to keep in mind when talking about the different antigens, because on the other side, we have the nucleocapsid protein. The nucleocapsid protein shows a very high similarity in between the different coronaviruses, which is not the case for the S1 domain. The S1 domain is very special, very unique for each human coronaviruses. So there are no cross reactivity to other worldwide endemic coronaviruses, which appear every winter season and where the seroprevalence is very high. For the nuclear capsid protein, it's different. It shows a very high homology. And of course, if you um, reply on a full length nuclear capsid protein cross reactivities to other human coronaviruses like the worldwide distributed ones can occur. So that's why we established an assay or developed an assay, which is based only on the diagnostical relevant epitopes and where the cross reacting or the epitopes with the highest homology in between the different coronaviruses are removed. And this gives us the same as the S1 based ELISA, a very specific approach. So let's talk about the S1 based ELISA. Here we offer two different ELISA. We offer one ELISA for the detection of IgA antibodies and one ELISA for the detection of IgG antibodies. 
Both of them are um, based on S1 domain, so they are also including the receptor binding domain. And in many external studies, it has been shown that this ELISA shows a very nice correlation to neutralization tests, which are the gold standard when we talk about immunity. Yeah, or protective immunity. So although there is still a big question mark if <clears throat> only a ELISA result can give you an answer in regards to immunity, there are still some hints that especially assays based on this domain um, are the ones also detecting neutralizing antibodies. And that's why it's also, of course, very uh, important to use these kind of assays for a vaccine development. Here you can see some data in regards to sensitivity. So here's a comparison in both tables of IgA and IgG. What you can see is as we divided our sample data into two different groups, we divided it in samples taken before 10 days after onset of symptoms and afterwards. The thing is, as I mentioned when I was talking about acute diagnostics, that's why serology also doesn't make sense because antibodies are produced later. So around, let's say, day 10 up to two days after onset of symptoms, the production of antibodies uh, are starting. And this is also something that you can see in the different sensitivities. So when we have a look at the sensitivities in samples taken before day 10 after onset of symptoms or direct detection method, we see a very low sensitivity. But this low sensitivity is not due an assay issue. It's just because of the prevalence of the antibodies in the sample, because until that day, there are rarely antibodies produced in COVID-19 patients. And this is the difference that you can see in samples taking after 10 days after onset of symptoms, you see a high increase in sensitivity for IgA and IgG. Yeah. So here again, another <clears throat> point why serology should not be used for acute diagnostics. But what I would also like to mention is, and you can see it also on the different results of sensitivity when comparing IgA and IgG, the IgA sensitivity in the earlier phase is much higher. So IgA might have an impact, especially in the early phase of infection, but please, it's not a replacement of the PCR, but especially if you want to monitor the infection or the immune response, this is a very helpful tool. When we have a look at the specificity, this of course I mentioned when I was talking about the different antigens, specificity is very important because you don't want to have cross reactivity to the worldwide distributed coronaviruses, which appear each winter seasons. They have a very high seroprevalence all over the world. So of course you want to be sure that the uh, positive result that you are detecting is based on a very specific antigen or very specific response. So when we have a look at the IgG, um, so on the, left, uh, on the right hand, you see that we have excellent specificity in different cohorts. We tested blood donors, pregnant women, children, also elderly patients because they are at the highest risk to get a severe um, COVID-19. We had very nice specificity so that the overall specificity resulted in 99.6%. When we have a look at IgA, we see a different picture, which is resulting or yielding in a total specificity of 92%. Because we have some false positive or unspecific reactivity within our IgA ELISA. So that's why this ELISA is not recommended to be used for screening proposals. It's mainly useful for monitoring the immune response in COVID-19 confirmed patients. There are several studies, more than 20 publications came out in the last months, also dealing with our ELISAs. But here are, in the next slides, I would like to give you a short summary about um, some presentations or some studies that were very interesting. So first of all, I would also like to show you the impact of IgA. Although the specificity is not that high, like with IgG, there's still an impact on detecting IgA. And this is very nicely shown in this study. You can see here in this picture 
that there is a comparison between IgM detection and IgA. And what you can see is that IgA is detectable earlier before IgM. Yeah? So it has a higher impact when we talk about the different phases of infection. It also shows a very strong response. Yeah? So the titers are much higher than for IgM and it also longer persists. And this, of course, has an impact when we think about the early phase of the infection, because in some cases, the um, production of IgG antibodies might be delayed. Yeah? So especially in the early case or the early phase of the disease, IgA detection has a higher impact, especially in regards to IgM. There are also some other studies uh, dealing with different uh, assays, uh, combining different assays. Here, there's a study done in the Netherlands, uh, also with our ELISA, with IgA and IgG, and which showed very, very nice sensitivity and specificity data. Sensitivity up to 100% for IgA and samples taking 14 days after onset of symptoms, 96% for IgG, and also very nice specificity of 99% for IgG. But here, again, specificity of IgA is a little bit lower than the one for IgG. Another study that was done <clears throat> was also published some weeks ago. And here the same approach was used. So there was the um, sensitivity and specificity determination of our ELISA also in comparison with other assays. But here in this study, they even included positive samples for other human coronaviruses. So the coronaviruses I mentioned already, which show a very high zero prevalence in the general population. And also here you can see nice sensitivity for IgG, IgA in samples taking around um, 10 or 14 days after onset of symptoms and very nice specificity of our IgG ELISA. So to sum it up, you can see that in the external studies, the high quality, the high specificity and sensitivity of our ELISA were proven. Another point I mentioned already is the big question mark in regards to immunity. Everybody now wants to know if they had contact with SARS-CoV-2 already and if they are immune. And this is still a question mark. This is still a question that has to be answered and this has to be addressed to the research groups or to the different coronavirus consignor labs, <clears throat> reference labs. One thing for sure, and this is something I mentioned when I was talking about the S1-based ELISA, is that it includes the receptor binding domain and that the receptor binding domain was uh, identified as a, a perfect antigen to trigger the production of neutralizing antibodies. So the antibodies that fight against the virus directly and the antibodies um, that uh, are important if we talk about immunity. And in some external studies, there has been proven that our ELISA show very nice confirmation with neutralization tests already. So this gives you at least a hint that with our ELISA, it might be possible to make an assumption in regards to immunity if somebody is positive. But nevertheless, more comprehensive studies are needed in this area. So the next ELISA I would like to talk about is the one based on the nucleocapsid protein. I mentioned already nucleocapsid protein shows a very high homology in between the different coronaviruses, but here we rely on a so-called designer antigen. So this nucleocapsid protein, which is used here, is more specific as only the diagnostical relevant epitopes are left and the um, cross-reacting or the very high similar um, epitopes which show a very high similarity in between the different coronaviruses are removed. So here we also have a very specific but also sensitive tool in our hands. When we think about sensitivity, so please have a look in the table um, on, the, uh, on the up. Um, there you can see that in the samples taken before 10 days after onset of symptoms or direct detection, 
you see a sensitivity of 80%, which is quite high and which gives you an idea that antibodies against the nucleocapsid protein might be produced earlier before the antibodies against the S1 domain. So here also in the early phase, this approach might be a helpful tool. And then of course, also the sensitivity increases of course, as uh, the samples were taken later after onset of symptoms. And as I mentioned, we are using a modified nucleocapsid protein, so not the naive, the full-length nucleocapsid protein. We also have here a very nice specificity with 99.8%. One thing that you have to keep in mind is, of course, the limitations of serological assays. And the limitations are mainly due to the prevalence. The prevalence at the moment is very low in most regions worldwide. Of course, we have some spots where the prevalence is much higher, but in the most areas, the prevalence might be around one to 2%, maybe 3%. So when we think about assays having a specificity of 99.6, 99.8%, we would have two to four false positive results in 1000 examination if we think about a prevalence of 1%. And this is of course a big issue because when you edit um, that there are big screening programs now are starting testing 1000, 10,000, 100,000, maybe 1 million people in regards to the zero status, you will have a lot of false positives. This of course will change when the prevalence is higher. So this is not a problem of the assay itself, but this is a problem of the prevalence. So as more people get infected, and this is something you can see in the table below, um, the false positive rate will also decrease. And to overcome this problem, we established a two-step diagnostic strategy. This is not an official strategy, this is just a strategy which might be possible for um, customers using our ELISA. And this two-step strategy is mainly based on the high specificity if you combine the S1-based IgG ELISA with the NCP-based IgG ELISA. So let's have a look at the table in regards to specificity. What you can see is if you put the results of both ELISAs together, you have 100% specificity. So the highest security when we are talking about mass screening of general populations. And the two-step strategy would be as followed. So on first line, you would use the NCP IgG ELISA for screening. If you have a negative result, there are no antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. If you have a positive or borderline result, you would go on and confirm these results by using the S1 based ELISA for IgG detection. If then the result is positive, you can say antibodies are present against SARS CoV 2. If the results are negative or borderline, we would recommend to take a follow up sample two to four weeks later. So here we don't ignore the negative result because as the NCP has been borderline or positive, there might be or the risk of having um, uh, of the patient to have had contact to the virus or to the pathogen already is higher. So that's why we would here recommend to test a follow up sample. And especially, as I mentioned, this approach is very important in areas with very low prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Another approach which I think is very nice because uh, you don't have these logistics problems that often appear when we talk about shipping blood samples from a doctor to a lab, for example. And this is the dried blood spot approach. So with dried blood spots, I think most of you are probably aware of this. It at least means you have a membrane and you just need a finger prick and you put your blood samples on this membrane and you can send the card, the so-called DBS card, just by regular mail to the lab or to the doctor uh, of your trust. So you need only a few drops of blood. No venous blood is needed anymore. Capillary blood is, uh, will be sufficient. Um, of course, the stability is also a big point because the blood card or the dried blood spot card itself 
don't have to be sent out cooled. You can just send it in the envelope to the doctor or to the lab. And you have a lower infection risk as the dried blood spot card, when the blood is dried, is not infectious anymore. This approach is available. We did a full CE validation with our NCP and S1 based IgG ELISAs. So here you can use instead of serum or plasma also dried blood spots as specimen. We can also offer the DBS card itself because we have established also our own card. And coming soon, there is also a dried blood spot set also including all the materials to take the blood and drop the blood on the filter paper, also for home-based testing. What we also offer due to our cooperation uh, or close relation to Perkin Alma, we can also offer here a fully automated system when <clears throat> using dried blood spot instead of serum or plasma. Here are some data. Um, comparison data when we think about venous blood, so general serum sample or plasma sample and DBS. And you can see here for both ELISA, we show very high correlation, very high PPA and NPA. So here we could really prove, and this was of course also part of our validation, that you could use uh, besides serum and plasma also DBS with our ELISA. Of course, in general, doesn't matter if we are talking about DBS serum or plasma, we have several automation solutions available uh, for small, medium or large labs. So whenever you have any question in regards to this automation, of course, you can get in contact with us. So to sum it up, um, and I will mainly focus on the IgG ELISAs as they are the main uh, issue because the main problem or the main question that shows up at the moment is Constance, uh, just just to remind I think the in terms of time so that we have the I've, I've, I've almost finished yeah okay so just to sum it up <clears throat> so with the IgG ELISA it's still not clear uh, if we can really talk about protective immunity there are more comprehensive studies required but nevertheless, we have very specific and sensitive tools in our hands already. And the combination, as I showed you gives, you, gives you the highest security when we talk about screening the general population. And of course, due to the DBS approach, we have another feature uh, of our ELISAs. But here we are still not at the end. So now I come to my last slide. Uh, we have just recently launched also in ELISA based on the modified nucleocapsid protein for the detection of IgM antibodies, which is also uh, available from now on. And with this slide, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Constance, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we will hold on to the questions and uh, quickly take them after the second presentation, which is coming from Dr. Christian Stochit uh, from um, Hologic. Uh, Dr. Christian is uh, the medical uh, scientific head, uh, scientific affairs and medical education head at uh, Hologic. Um, he is a multilingual professional with uh, 12 years of experience in medical affairs and diagnostics, sales and business development with extensive ex experience in coordinating global projects in the public and private sector. Uh, he is passionate about, about outcome-driven and value-based healthcare, and he holds an MSc in biophysics uh, and immunology as well as a PhD in microbiology and computer science. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me hand over to Dr. Christian. Over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome to the session on SARS-CoV-2. I'm quite happy to um, share um, Hologic solution to address the global pandemic. And the talk will have a focus on our essay-based solution and how they actually work in conjunction with our fully automated high throughput solution. Before I go into that, just a quick word on the logic itself. 
we do way more than just molecular diagnostics. We are market leader in breast and skeletal health solutions with our 3D mammography systems around the world, as well as our gynecology uh, surgical solutions. So today we just focus on diagnostics in particular on the first question, but there's more to learn in terms of breast biopsy. Um, I think it goes without saying that we are one of the global players in the market. And if you have a look at Europe, Middle East, Africa alone, we reach out to over 50 million um, individuals each year. Um, and that means we drive diagnostics and treatment to uh, help to save lives by doing that. Uh, it looks like we are losing you a bit. Maybe you, uh, if you keep the microphone okay. close by. All right. So um, we have a high level of expertise in public health and population based screening. And we are one of the market, we are one of the market leaders uh, in cervical health, as well as sexually transmitted infection, viral load testing for HIV and hepatitis, as well as respiratory infections, which will be part of that um, this talk I'm giving today. So when it comes to um, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, I'm sure you're well aware that today flexibility is required with um, testing paradigm shifting almost on a daily basis right now, we are in a search where a high demand of SARS-CoV-2 testing is required that pushes back molecular routine diagnostics to a certain level. But moving forward, I think the picture will change. So I believe um, SARS-CoV-2 routine screening will slightly go down and the molecular standard routine visits will recover. Um, and therefore we believe the only way to cover SARS-CoV-2 in conjunction with standard molecular diagnostics is through an automated platform with a high degree of workflow flexibility, high throughput, and of course a large SM menu um, consolidated onto one single platform. That's what we have. We have an instrument called the Panther instrument, and that's a sample preparation to result analysis um, instrument. It does everything. Extractions on the instrument as well as the amplification and detection. So it's a one-stop shop solution for your uh, molecular diagnostics laboratory. Um, our instrument offers what an unparalleled workflow. It's a random access system. So it breaks you free from all the restrictions you might have with batch processing platforms. And we have a very high throughput and we challenge our instrument on a daily basis nowadays. And if you run a 24 seven labs, just for SARS CoV 2 alone, you can easily run up to 1,000 samples uh, in 24 hours, which is a remarkable high uh, throughput. Our instrument base in Africa is shown on this slide. So at this point in time, we have 54 instruments in about 13 countries. And I'm sure you, if you recognize the countries you are in and what our Panther fleet uh, looks like, that means that we are well positioned to uh, also cover. So our, SARS, uh, our optimal SARS-CoV-2 assay is a, is a fairly new assay to market. It's a dual target assay, which is in line with WHO regulations as well as FIND recommendation. It's molecular amplification assay to detect the virus in respiratory samples. So what we do in contrast to what Constanza said before, we try to catch active infection and also uh, try to be um, the number one for contact tracing environments to, to realize, to figure out contact to a SARS-CoV-2 patient moving forward. As I said, the test runs on an existing install base. That was a strategy that we decided to, to um, do. And the biggest benefit of the platform is that extraction application is fully automated on the instrument. And as I mentioned before, the throughput is key to success. From a um, sampling perspective, there are several options depending on what your um, swap situation looks like and you are painfully aware of global swap shortages through several countries and um, all of us are affected by that. So that's why we kept our uh, front end sample taking um, activity rather flexible. So you have different solutions, either it's the uh, virus transport medium based sample collection or you have uh, our up to a multi-test kit where you just uh, sample and put it directly onto the Panther instrument without any, any intervention in between. So that gives you 
clarity and confidence that you have various options to, to get the, um, the right swap sample uh, onto our platforms. Uh, Christian, we, we keep losing you in bits. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm right sure. next to a microphone, so. Okay. Oh. Okay, so we came to, um, we came with our SARS-CoV-2 solution very, very early in the, in, the, um, in the pandemic. So in March, we had the first SARS-CoV-2 assay available on our Panzer Fusion instrument. And what I'm doing, what I'm showing in the next couple of slides is just screenshots from publications uh, that had a look at the performance of our assay solutions. And in this particular publication, the author had a look at about four different commercially available assays. And for our solution, the best sensitivity was 100%. That means you're not missing out on a false negative um, individual. And the specificity was also very high, um, up to 98% um, upon interrogation of uh, two discrepant samples. Again, that means we knew very early on that what we bring to market works. And in combination with uh, a, a very high throughput, we were on the right track to really tackle the pandemic. The next solution we released at the Optima SARS-CoV-2 um, assay. And in, first of all, we want to understand, okay, does the assay do what it says? So it means we compared this Optima SARS-CoV-2 assay to our Panther Fusion-based assay. And as you can see here, um, it works really well. The design goals uh, have been similar and the performance has been even better compared to our first um, assay solution. In the last recent weeks, there were some publications on that um, optimal SARS-CoV-2 assay, which I am showing here in the next couple of slides. That's a publication that came out just a couple of weeks ago, um, where the authors had a look at the, um, the clinical sensitivity of our assay compared with two um, standard of care assays that are still that are on market and fairly used. It's the King, it's the Thermo Fisher Tech Path assay and the um, CDC um, PCR assay. And if you have a look at the, uh, the um, right side of the, of the screen, you can see that um, the manual uh, methods um, do not perform fairly well with a low concentration of the virus. Um, and that's also shown in another graph over here where they also had a look at true clinical uh, level frame real specimens and the TMA-based assay with optimal SARS-CoV-2 outperformed the RT-PCR assays. Um, that means that in that particular publication, optimal SARS-CoV-2 had the highest analytical and clinical sensitivity compared to standard of care assays that are on market for, for quite a while. Um, the second publication just came out a week ago um, where the group had a look at both of our logic uh, last of two solutions and compared to uh, the third party um, assay. And this table summarizes the characteristics and workflow parameters of the assays. And um, without going into too many details in the interval of time, um, we could demonstrate that we have the highest flexibility for sample types. We have the best analytical sensitivity, the least hands-on time for run, and the very high throughput. So again, we outperform another um, standard SEO market um, by far. And with that, I thank you very much for your time. I know it was a very quick and short overview of our solution, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Christian, for the wonderful presentation. Um, now it's time for us to get into the questions and uh, um, answers. And uh, we shall take the questions from the chat box. So keep them coming uh, as we begin our Q&A and A session. Um, I'll take the first question that came from Halimatu Job. Uh, from Senegal, uh, he says, do we have an idea of the time of appearance of antibodies? How long exactly after the onset of symptoms? Um, he is asking this because there are many antibody testing 
uh, kids, I think, by the deep, but they do differ on the time of appearance of an antibody. Um, maybe this is directed to uh, Constance. Mm -hmm. Any response? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So in general, of course, we have to differentiate uh, between the different immune globulin classes when we talk about antibody appearance. What we know so far is that often IgM and IgG antibodies appear at the same time. But as I mentioned, IgA can have an impact because the production of IgA antibody seems to start a little bit earlier. So in general, what we see and what is also described in liter literature is um, that antibodies with highest sensitivity are detectable up uh, from day 10 after onset of symptoms. Yeah? And then of course the sensitivity increases. But in some cases it might be also possible that you detect antibodies already on day seven or eight after onset of symptoms. This is very difficult to uh, generally answer this question because each patient seems to have a very individual immune response. Yeah? But I think to have as a guideline, let's say in the second week after onset of symptoms, I think this is a very good number that you can deal with. Yeah? But of course, it might be that patients are still negative and that the antibodies may be uh, detectable on day 14 after onset of symptoms. Yeah, but I think to start in the first week after onset of symptoms doesn't make sense at all. Maybe let's say at the half of the second week, this would make sense. But it of course also depends on the immune globulin class. Thank you, Constance. Uh, indeed, it's a, it's a very dynamic uh, environment and we hope we continue to learn, I think uh, as the pandemic uh, evolves. Uh, Sami Otaiwo uh, says, very nice and deep presentation by Dr. Constance. No, oh, thank uh, you very much. We share the same sentiments. Thank you. And uh, Abdel Abbas Anzaku says, you spoke about neutralizing antibodies. What is the possibility that a recovered patient is likely to be reinfected with SARS-CoV-2? Ooh, that is a, immune? Yeah. That is a very difficult question. And this is actually the big question mark. Yeah, when we talk about reinfection, about immunity. So when we sum up the experience we've had with MERS, with DARS, where we had outbreaks in the last, yeah, let's say 20 years. The outbreaks, of course, were much smaller, but there were a lot of research ongoing. So what we saw then is that in most cases, and I will mainly refer to SARS-CoV, let's say it one, so the SARS coronavirus that appeared in 2003, what we saw here that after three to six years, no antibodies were detectable anymore. But that doesn't mean that the patient is not immune because you have to think about that on one side, they have the humoral immunity, but you also have the cellular immunity. Mm -hmm. And this is also a big factor. Also, when we talk about SARS-CoV-2, you might have read some publications, some studies dealing with cellular immunity. They are talking about the cytokine storm. Yeah. So beside the antibody uh, production, they are also the cellular immunity or the cellular immune response that is increasing a lot. And this also varies from patient to patient. So when we talk about immunity, we have to talk about both. When we talk about neutralizing antibodies, we talk about antibodies that you can detect. You can mainly detect them by neutralization test. And then of course, if you are positive, you can say, okay, you are immune, but how long this we will see. The virus is still very new for us. We just have it now in our area, let's say maybe six months, six months in Germany, even less in Germany, we have four months, yeah? let's say six, seven months in China. We still have to learn more about the virus. So this is an answer we cannot answer yet. Maybe in one, we one year, we will have uh, yeah, a higher in uh, insight into this research. Yeah? But this is definitely questions that have to be answered. Also, when we talk about vaccines. Hmm. Yeah, interesting indeed. Um, an additional question, uh, perhaps I'll combine them with, uh, yeah, two of them. You talked about DBS somewhere, and then Ngo Jingane says, 
not sure if we can generally say that GBS are not infectious. And then I would kindly also ask you to just respond this one from Ellen Bay, uh, who spoke about whether you're planning to get WHO, PQ, and EUL, um, which we usually uh, sort of use as a proxy marker of some kind of uh, guaranteed uh, performance. Uh, and this also speaks to questions from Faisayo Jegede, who wanted to ask about PPVs and uh, uh, issues of reliability. Mm -hmm. So, um, in uh, regards to DBS, of course, this depends on the uh, general on the, or on the different authorities. Yeah? For example, in Europe, if you have uh, the dried uh, or the blood spots dried, it's not infectious anymore. But this can, of course, um, depends on the different uh, regulation in each country. I mean, at least you have to be careful anyway with these kind of material. Yeah, this for sure. In regards to WHO, uh, last Friday, the WHO just opened uh, the, the, the process for ELISAs. Before, it was only open for molecular tests and rapid tests. So we will, of course, also be part of this and will pre-qualify our essays with the WHO EU, uh, EUL list. Yeah, for sure. Because it's, of course, it's a, it's a point of quality. And uh, of course, then you are able to distribute your test also in other countries which have other restrictions. Yeah. So this is definitely on our plan. So the third question, if I understood correctly, was around a positive predicted value, right? Yeah. PPV. Yeah. This was something I mentioned because these are the limitations when we talk about an essay. If, although you have very high specificity, higher than 99%, there's still one percentage giving false positive results. And of course, if you have a very low prevalence, you will have a lot of false positive cases. And as more people you are screening, the most people in, at the moment and even governments are interested in mass screening of general populations, this is an issue. And of course, because false positive results have, an, uh, have a risk, because if somebody is um, resulting in a false positive result, he might think that, the, uh, that he is immune and might think, okay, I don't have to take care about the restriction. I don't need to wear a mask and something like this. So of course, there's a big risk to, to uh, get uh, the pandemic under control. This is not happening when you send out all serological positives uh, out in the general world, in the normal world before coronavirus. Yeah? So that's why we established a two-step strategy to have the highest specificity. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Constance. Let me turn to um, Christian. Um, I have a question from Ayatenu, uh, who wants to know what are the viral target genes of the kit? And then um, maybe you can take this one again from Katrina, um, who is asking, is Hologic investigating the use of saliva as an alternative matrix for SARS-CoV-2 testing? Okay. Um, the the gene targets we use are in the orf one ad region, and we chose that region on purpose um, because based on bioinformatics, we are very sure that the regions that we are targeting are less affected by potential mutations. And there are already some publications out there indicating that the N gene or E gene are prone to mutation, and that's already out there. So we try to purposely stay away from those as an example. That's why the region we use is orf one ad the question, the, the question on saliva, that's a very hot topic of discussion. And um, of course, uh, it, that would be the most ideal um, um, sample for any mass screening assay. Um, and based on current literature, that's a bit of a mixed bag. So some research groups point out that it works really well as a um, sample to screen. Others are a little more concerned about the quality or the, the um, standardization of saliva. But I believe um, moving forward, it will play an important role. 
that's definitely what I believe in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really an, a hot and relevant topic indeed. Um, Jibrin Kama, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, he says, thanks a lot for the presentation, Christian. Uh, for Hologic, when will the COVID-19 assay be available in Africa for the Panther platform? Is, um, is, this, is this assay the same as that one for the Panther Fusion? Um, normally, we don't take this question, but I think it's becoming more and more important to sure. apply security. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's also an important question because as many of you are painfully aware, there are several companies in the world struggling to supply reagents or consumables to make sure that you have uh, the opportunity to do SARS-CoV-2 testing. It's, it's not very different for logic. So we need to be very mindful what and how and in which quantities we provide to, to certain countries. For Africa, we will be able to supply the Optima SARS-CoV-2 assay in a certain number. And we just initiated first um, validation studies in Zambia. So this is happening as we speak. Um, so stay tuned. Um, the assay will become available in Africa as well. And we do have our own teams in Africa. So it's not just we drop the assay and we go. Um, we have 54 instruments in the, in, the, in the continent. And of course, we do have the right infrastructure in place to support uh, the activities um, and also make sure that uh, if a pamphlet is available to do SARS-CoV-2 testing, that we will look at it very closely. Yes. Thank you. Um, in important consideration indeed. And Sylvester Moyo um, also wants to know, I think it's something similar, um, following Hologic, he has been following Hologic and understands that there is version one and version two of the SARS-CoV-2 test that was being developed. What are the differences? Are both available or just one version now? He goes on to say, he sees that there are uh, presented targets uh, is ORF and RF8. Do both of them target this gene or the differ? He just wants to understand the advantages of, of, so, of those being targeted. So, okay, both of our solutions, the, the Optima SARS-CoV-2 on the Panther, as well as the Fusion SARS-CoV-2 on the Panther Fusion, have the same gene target. So there's no difference. That's where the performance is equivalent. The key difference is that uh, the Panther assay is based on TMA technology, whereas the Fusion assay is based on real-time PCR technology. A long story short, to, from, a, from a result that you get, it doesn't make a huge difference. Um, both assays are available, but not available at the same time throughout the world. So again, this brings me back to the topic of allocation. So we at Logic have to be very mindful which assay to supply to which country. So it's not like you can pick and choose one over the other. We will probably be able to supply one assay out of two to your country or uh, to your lab laboratory, and that's about it. You will probably get access to an assay from us, but you, you simply cannot pick and choose. That's the reality. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Christian. Um, let me go back to Constance, uh, and this is from uh, Johannes uh, Eschete. Um, says, how feasible, uh, and I think this is quite a, uh, an important consideration that has come quite a number of times. How feasible is ELISA-based IgA, IgG testing uh, to be used in resource-limited testing, uh, in resource-limited countries? Is there any advantage compared to lateral flow uh, serology or IgM uh, testing? Mm -hmm. Well, what I think... Is, what yeah. is the additional benefit for ELISA? Yeah, I mean, the general benefit, I think, is uh, that lateral flow assays often have a problem with sensitivity. And in case of coronavirus, also in specificity. We have had already some studies that were published in regards to uh, lateral flow assays, the WHO, for example, and also the CDC and also some other authorities don't uh, accept lateral flow assays or rapid tests for the diagnostics. So I would always rely on other assays like ELISA, but I 
totally understand that in some cases, even in ELISA, because you would need a reader, you would need in best case also a washer, because the extra equipment that you need is more than you would need for a lateral flow assay. But maybe here, even the DBS approach can uh, help because often lateral flow assays are done at the general medical doctor because they are easy to be done and they are also, um, yeah, let's say you get a quick re result, of course, and you don't have this logistic problem. But this, uh, two of these problems you can overcome if you would rely also on DBS because a doctor would just take the blood, even not venous blood is needed, and could then collect the different DBS cards and send it to a lab. Yeah, so you don't need the cooling of the samples and so on. So there are some advantages. But I totally understand that uh, special equipment is needed for some labs. Yeah? But I think in general, and it's probably the same also in Africa, that the SARS-CoV-2 uh, diagnostics is probably mainly done in reference labs. And they probably have all the equipment that is needed uh, for the ELISA. Yeah? And based on the studies, that were published, low sensitivity, in some cases also low specificity, I would rely on, on methods like ELISA or immunoblot or even immunofluorescence if available. Yeah, thank you very much. And that's a very important consideration when it comes to issues of validation and verification of even the lateral flow assays. Mm. And this really becomes uh, quite, quite handy. Um, I am seeing an interesting comment that is coming through just now, really coming back to DBS, because that's something also interesting. It is important to account for the additional person hours needed for specimen processing. Uh, I think uh, this is from the yeah. So the general procedure of our ELISA is around two hours, and you would need to add one hour of extraction. Yeah. So when you have the DBS, you punch out uh, uh, the, the, yeah, the part of the, of the card, of the filter paper, and then you have to extract the sample by the buffer that is coming with our kit. So you don't need an extraction kit or something like this, so no extra costs. And then you need one hour at 37 degree for extraction. But then you can use the, uh, the sample directly. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Christian, as we try to round off here, uh, a quick question, which uh, is also quite important. I think you touched a bit on, it's around the issues of security, of availability of reagents. Is the production of the SARS-CoV-2 reagents biologic impacting other diagnostic test kits, uh, such as HIV viral load? That is a very, very good question. And of course, of interest, and I can assure you that is not the case. We ramped up our production for our kind of assays very substantially. And we also have a almost dedicated production site in Europe where we, where we almost exclusively produce for Europe, Middle East, Africa, but we, that we do not have any logistics problem with products in the United States, which also already happened with some other companies. So I think it's very safe to say uh, if you run HIV or all viral load assays, you will not see any impact. All right, thank you. Thank you for the assurance. Um, whilst you are there, um, I just want to ask you to maybe give us 30 seconds, uh, any of your uh, closing remarks. Christian? Okay. Um, I think right now in the search of SARS-CoV-2, it is uh, absolutely critical to, to catch all symptomatic as well as asymptomatic contacts. And therefore you do need molecular diagnostics. Any assay you can get your hands on, that's very key to, to succeed. Once that is under control, then antibody-based testing probably will play an important role moving forward um, for surveillance reason as well as for public health research. So I think um, the combination of molecular diagnostics as well as antibody-based serology as we've heard today is a good combination um, to, to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, useful words indeed. Um, 
Dr. Constance, uh, in 30 seconds, any last word? Yeah, I totally agree with my colleague uh, that you need the combination anyway, yeah, like we have it also with other viral diseases. And here, of course, mainly serology will play a big part when we talk about immunity, neutralizing antibodies, and when we talk about reinfection. But this is still a big question mark. I pointed it out already several times. And here, of course, molecular tests, but also serological assays will help hopefully also the research to get a better insight into the virus and maybe also to, um, yeah, to help for further outbreaks that will happen when we talk about other diseases also. Thank, thank you very much. Indeed, molecular tests continue to become very important as we are trying to detect the active infections. Uh, as well as the serology tests for surveillance and maybe later on uh, they will become more and more useful for our public health uses. Uh, we are also thinking of anti antigen tests uh, as we have seen I think uh, there is a drive to really see if this can be very useful. Um, thank you very much for coming through. Um, we know uh, we have some questions around certificates. As you might have heard, uh, with the situation in Addis, uh, our IT and uh, connectivity has been affected a bit. So we will send you all the details that you will need to download um, the certificates via email once this is sorted. Um, and I also want to inform you that uh, we have another session this Friday, also interesting, serology related. We're going to be sending you the invite immediately after this session. So look out for that. Until we meet again, uh, thank you and goodbye for now.